It gets real. You're the landlord. We're here to help. This is a show for what the gurus don't tell you about owning rentals. We're here for you because we're stronger together. Brought to you by Empire Industries Property Management. Built for investors. By investors. For more information about this show, please visit our website, selfmanagemyproperty.com, home of the ultimate Landlord Survival Handbook. Now, the Landlord Survival Show with your host, Steve Rosenberg. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Landlord Survival Show. This is your host, Steve Rosenberg, and this is episode number two. I am so excited to have a good friend of mine. Last week, uh, episode number one, obviously, we had uh, Pete and myself on the show talking about kind of our trials and tribulations of failing as investors and doing what all the people told us to do, but they didn't give us the uh, second half of the book, I guess you could say. And uh, the reason we created this show is we're just kind of, you know, I get kind of tired and fed up of hearing all the gurus and all the people tell me about all the shit and all the things that you should be doing to buy a deal, but nobody ever tells you what you do after you own that deal. And it's very frustrating for me because I was one of those guys that bought all these deals and no one ever told me what to do after the fact, the next morning, kind of like the hangover period. And I realized that nobody shows you that because a lot of people don't know how to do that. And they don't teach you where the rubber meets the road and what actually happens when you've got to be real and actually get the return out of your dollars, make it happen with your real estate. So my business partner, Pete, and I, we created this show, the, the Landlord Survival Show. And we also created a website, selfmanagemyproperty.com. And we even have a Facebook group, the Landlord Survival Facebook group. And it's really a place for investors to come and talk about real life stuff that happens to investors. And, you know, I, I couldn't think of a, a better guest to have than my good friend, Joe Fairless, who's uh, on, uh, where are you at, Joe? You at some, your beach house or something this weekend or your lake house? Where are you? <laughs> I, I, I am at my lake house right now. Yes. And uh, outside of Cincinnati, about 60 minutes outside of Cincinnati. All right. All right. And so we're going to talk about Joe and what he's done. Cause I'm sure since we've spoken with him, he's probably bought a city or done something magnificent like he always does. Um, but, uh, Joe had me on his show. Gosh, I think it was a couple years ago now that I was on one of your shows in the beginning. And, uh, you know, th this is a guy that just is, is out there doing it. I mean, he is making stuff happen. He's all over the place and he's just, I couldn't think of a better person to talk about rubber meeting the road than, than my good friend, Joe Fairless. So Joe, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy swim day or whatever it is you do while you're on vacation up there. But, um, tell everyone just a little bit about yourself, your, your background, maybe kind of some of your investing, uh, history just to kind of people get to know you a little bit. Yeah, happy to. And I love the concept that you described for this new show. And, and just to be clear, I, I am working while we're at the lake house, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not just a vacation, but, um, it is nice to be able to, uh, work while overlooking a lake versus just my desk. Um, I, th so I think big, people like us always work, Joe. I don't think I don't think we yeah. know what a day. Are. <laughs> you know, it's 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 not. I, I guess we shouldn't even really call it work, right? Because we do it because deep down in our hearts, we we love this, right? We love the heat of yeah. battle. We love the 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 grind. I mean, it's kind of what we wake up for, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's actually how I got to this point. I mean, you asked to talk a little bit about my background. Well, my background is that I am doing now what I enjoy doing, whereas before I uh, wasn't fulfilled in what I was doing. And Tony Robbins talks about the six human needs, and two of those needs are uh, lead to fulfillment, and that's growth and contribution. So I previously was at an advertising agency uh, before I was full-time in real estate investing, and it was in New York City. I was the youngest vice president of an advertising agency, climbed the ranks from being a project, ma a junior project manager, don't forget the junior part, a junior project manager to a VP of an advertising agency. At first, I was making 30K a year in New York City, which doesn't go too far. That's then like a bus pass, about, right? That, that's how that's yeah, just I, for fares to get across the bridges. Absolutely. Yeah. And then eventually you have to find a way to eat food, too. Um, <laughs> but I, I was able to you know, make it through that, climb the corporate ladder relatively quickly. And then once I 
once I got a certain point, and in my mind, the point was making $100,000 by my 30th birthday. I thought I would be able to be, I, I think I thought I was going to be able to retire, actually, <laughs> quite frankly, <laughs> when I made $100,000 by my 30th birthday. But what I realized is I achieved that financial goal and I was like, okay, but now what? And I'm not as settled as I thought I would be, or I'm not as content as I thought I would be with what I'm doing. And so that led me to really take a hard look at what I was focusing my time on. And this is when I was about 30. Well, actually, I got I got the 100K mark when I was 29, I believe. So I was right before my 30th birthday, I realized that I'm 35, 35 today. Uh, or not today, but now I'm 35. Happy birthday, and, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and my, and the, um, you know, the, the thing that I thought of was, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample life experiences. I'm going to try out certain things while I have my full-time job, while I have the salary. And, you know, I'm going to see what I like, what I don't like. And that's, a, I believe, a great way to test um, to see what we like and what we don't like and what we gravitate towards while still having some a safety net of some sort. And my suggestion, what happened with, with me is whenever you find yourself completely dedicated and focused on something that you're sampling and you're not focused and dedicated towards your full-time job, that's when you need to make the jump uh, or at least begin the transition. And that's what happened. I did improv classes. I um, started interviewing people who have remarkable careers, learning about their careers because I was going to write a book about it. I was investing on the side in single family homes while living in New York City. I was investing in Texas in single family homes. And um, I started teaching a class on it because a lot of my friends were, were wanting to know how I was able to buy these homes while living in New York City, but I was buying in Texas. So I started teaching class on it and eventually I realized, hey, this is something that I want to focus on full time and um, put the pieces in place, meaning I saved up money. I did a cash out refinance on one of the homes, got $50,000 in the bank account uh, as a result of that cash out refinance. And I made the, made the leap and ended up um, doing apartment investing full time after that. So let, let me let me kind of back up a little bit here, Joe, because you said a lot of things that I think a lot of our listeners probably kind of cycle through in their minds and try to figure out how to do. You, you know, you, you said that you had a past life. You had a, you had a career, right? You had a successful career path that whether it was going to make you 50000 or 250000 you, you had a, a good job that was probably about as safe and secure as a job could be. And, you know, the... Obviously, you wanted more. You, you kind of got to to the area that you wanted and thought, eh, it's not really what I want. How did you actually make that decision to take that step? Because that that's a mental shift, right? I mean, you, you had to do some serious soul searching to say, even though you treaded the water, at some point you had to pull the ripcord and, and bail out, right? So can you kind of explain how you did that? Because I think a lot of investors and a lot of listeners – probably go through that and don't know some jump too soon, some jump too late, some never jump at all and come back and land with the plane again, you know? So how, how did you go through that mental process to, to have it make sense to you to actually do it? Well, I mean, ultimately when I find, when I found myself being annoyed by the work requests that were coming in from my full-time job, because I was so focused on doing my side thing, which was, uh, studying apartment investing and teaching that class, I realized it wasn't fair to myself and it wasn't fair to my employer to continue to be employed. So my, I sent out an email and this is part of it. I sent an email to my family, uh, to my mom, my dad, my sister and my brothers. And I said, I'm quitting the advertising world in two months, this was October, so at the end of the year, um, I'm quitting the advertising industry in two months. I came, I conquered, now I don't care about it anymore at all. I am going to be focusing my time on uh, learning apartment investing and buying apartments. And um, I also wanted to do career consulting, but that, 
that didn't really transpire. And um, I appreciate, you know, support. It's going to be scary. It's going to be something that I'm leaving uh, or I'm leaving a good salary to basically nothing. But, um, you know, I, I'm confident I can make it happen. I still have that email printed on, or I, I have printed that email and it's on my wall in my office. That is and cool. I, I, I can, you know, it's dated. It's sent to, you know, see what I wrote to everyone, see who was on the email. It is really cool. And one, so to answer your question for anyone thinking about taking the leap, well, one, it doesn't have to be as cut and dry as taking the leap. So I suggest sample life experiences while you have your full-time gig and then determine at what point in time is your full-time gig getting in the way of what you want to really pursue. That's number one. And number two is make a public statement, make a declaration to those who you love or some other people. I mean, there's apps for this too, where you say, I'm going to do something. I'm going to work out five times. And then you put in the app, that's what you're going to do. And then you have the crowd to hold you accountable, however you want to do it, but make a declaration to others about what you're doing. And then that does two things. One, that helps hold you accountable to what you say you're going to do. But then two, that brings in others to potentially help you out along the way. Because as you and I both know, and the majority of your, your listeners know, real estate's a team game. You know, you, you try to do this thing one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, good luck, buddy. Yeah. That's going to be really hard. So when you involve others in what you're doing and what you plan on doing, then you're ultimately going to be set up for more success than if you didn't. So let me ask you this. So you, you sent the email, the, the manifesto, if you will, to your family and said, hey, this is my plan. This is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the ripcord. I'm all in. How many how many people or family or, or friends that, you know, kind of – put their arm around your shoulder and kind of want to give you that good sound advice to tell you you're making a mistake and you shouldn't do it. Uh, how many of those kinds of people came around at that time to kind of tell you, you know, don't get too, uh, don't get too into this. If it doesn't work, it's okay. You can always go back. What, did you get a lot of that or, or just, you shouldn't do it or what, what was the feedback? I got, um, one, so what my oldest brother said something similar to what you just said. He said, uh, boy, that sounds great, uh, but sometimes you want to get certain things in order, meaning, you know, save money or, you know, something with finances right. uh, until you take that, in, until you, um, you know, take that type of leap. Otherwise, it could wipe out everything you've built so far. Yeah. And, and you know, what's funny, Joe, is, is uh, you know, you get a lot of people that they they all of a sudden they, they want to give you that advice where they put their arm around your shoulder and it, you know, let me just, let me give you some advice. And you know, what's interesting is when we're, when we're all children or when we have children, you know, you tell your children that you can do whatever you want to do. If you want to be an astronaut, you can be an astronaut. If you want to be an Olympic athlete, you can be that. But at some point in your life, you go from being told you can do whatever you want to do to then when you actually come in and say, I want to do this, there's the people that come in and say, well, it may not work out for you. And maybe you want to have a contingency plan. And I think to myself, where did that change happen? Right? Because I was told I could be whatever I wanted to be and whoever I wanted to be. Now I'm told be prepared to fail because it may not work out and you should go back to your safe, secure job. So uh, at least you didn't have a lot of people telling you that because that, that obviously gives you doubt, right? And it may be you know, before you make that big jump, you kind of maybe stumble a little bit before you get to the ledge, so to speak. So that I know there's a lot of people that talk to me and they say, well, I was going to do this. And then I had everyone in my family that are, you know, smart and attorneys and accountants and told me all the reasons why I shouldn't do it. And I think everybody tells me why you can't do something, but nobody ever tells you why you can. You could do it. You could go out and you could become a millionaire owning tons of apartments and real estate like you've done. Or you could not do it and always wonder, right? And and I'm just curious what the feedback was when you started having success in your realm. Yeah, I and, and to his credit, once he told me that, and then I said, yeah, but you know, I've got uh, 
I've got a plan and here's my plan and you know, I'm going to uh, buy an apartment building. I'm going to partner up with a couple people and I can always go back uh, if I need to, but I really don't want to. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, sounds great. And he was, was on board other than him. Um, I, in his initial comment, uh, I, I didn't receive any, um, you know, any feedback of, Hey, you sure you want to do that? And even if I did, I have blocked it out of my mind. And I even blocked that out of my mind at the time sure. because I'm so focused on, you know, what I'm, what I'm looking to do. And, uh, I'd say for, uh, anyone listening who is looking to do something different from what you're currently doing one suggestion I have that's been helpful for me is instead of thinking about how to do it, think about who can help you learn how to do it. Because the how to do it, when we, like, if, if for example, if someone's wanting to do apartment investing, do them what I do, and they start reading the book on how to do apartment investing, I mean, that can be overwhelming depending on where they're at in their learning um, cycle compared to if it's who can help me to do it, then it's, Oh, well, who do I know? Or who can I know? Who can I get to know? Who can help me um, learn how to do something? Um, And it's, it puts us in a much more resourceful state of mind because it's less, being information overload with the how, but it's more being resourceful with, okay, who do I know or who can I get to know who can help me? Right. Yeah. So true. It's, it's, you know, the words you say become your reality and the questions you ask kind of can dictate your, your path. And you ask the wrong questions, you'll go down the wrong path. And if you say the wrong things, that starts becoming your paradigm and that becomes who you are and, and how you think. So it's your words become your reality. And, and that, that's a very good point. Now, Joe, obviously you're, you're, you're very successful at what you do. And we'll get into some more specifics in a minute. But let me ask you, for, for people that are trying to do this, I know that in general, it, if you are all in, right, in order to get that, we'll call it the momentum wheel turning, you have to exert a lot of force, and, and the way, what I mean by that is you've got to put a lot of time and energy and effort to get that wheel of momentum turning. As you're doing that, you only have 24 hours in a day. So obviously something is going to give. How does someone like you, how do you balance family and, you know, loved ones and running your business and doing all that? It may be easier for you now. I don't know. But, but how, what's advice for you to give people? Because, you know, you have to trade you know, to, to, to be successful, you have to trade that for failure, right? To be successful, you have to trade those lonely nights when everyone else is partying and even time with your loved ones, you've got to go work and it's a trade-off. You're trading one for the other. So how do you do that? I don't focus on balance. I focus on integration. And, uh, you know, I, when, what I mean by that is I don't think, okay, I have – a certain time where I turn my um, my attention towards uh, only work, or actually sometimes I do turn my attention only to family though. But I, I don't have any times where you know I'm off limits right. for you know my family or or anything. Um, you don't compartmentalize I, your life to where you shut one down and, and nobody talk to me while I'm working type type scenarios that. That's correct. I mean, clearly, if I'm on a call, I, you know, sure. Colleen, my wife, wouldn't come in here. and Well, she might actually, but she wouldn't talk to me. She <laughs> might do something. Some hand signals um, or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, um, so, I mean, my, my, my focus is on um, having a vision for where I would want us to go as, you know, well, having a vision for myself, first off. Uh, and knowing what do I want financially, um, uh, relationship-wise, spiritually, uh, physically, all the different areas of my life, and then sharing that with 
my wife, Colleen, who is pregnant. We're having our first kid in like late October. So there will be another dynamic certainly in play mm-hmm. once we have a daughter uh, this October. And um, the, 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 it reminds me of when you asked me that question, it reminds me of the oxygen mask when, you know, you're, you're going through the, the pre-flight instructions with the flight attendant. They tell you to put your oxygen mask on first and then put it on a little kid or whoever. That way you both live and you both don't die for lack of oxygen. And um, I think of it the same way. Oprah talks about this as well. You got to take care of yourself first. So I think of the different goals that I'm looking for across all those different categories. And then I share it with Colleen and then we talk about it and I might revise some. Uh, she also creates a list for herself and together we have a vision. And I think that's what's important because when together you have a vision for where your you and your family are headed Um, both from a business standpoint and uh, relationships and everything else, then we, we don't have to focus as much on, um, okay, this is a certain period that we're blocking off. It's more, we're just integrating it. For example, uh, we went on an investor tour and granted my business is at a certain level. So I, I can do this, but this is just an example We went to, Colleen and I went to uh, L.A., San Francisco, um, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York City. uh, Over the last, uh, well, this past spring, we we went there, spring and summer. And we met with investors, but, you know, we spent three, four, sometimes a week, two weeks in each of those cities three, four days, sometimes two, one to two weeks in each of those cities. And by integrating uh, work stuff as well as play stuff, it's great. I don't have to worry about balance. It's sure. more about just incorporating it all. Well, I think you said it perfect with integration. And I mean, what, what you just described is true integration. You're, you're integrating everything where you're just kind of combining it to make more of a solid kind of more of a solid form than than separating them out and stripping them out and you know this this compartmentalized over here this is over there we don't we don't cross swords we don't you know and that that obviously I mean obviously it can work for people I agree with you it's not a successful model but I'm sure it could work I think your way of integrating and doing it together is, is more fulfilling in in your professional and personal life and it, and it gets your wife on board with what you're doing so that you're not spending hours away and she's going, what, what's going on? At least she understands the goal and, the, and what you're doing. Um, you know, you, you said something earlier about having the goal, and, and I'm assuming you're, you're probably a pretty goal-oriented person. Uh, much, you know, many successful people are to, to a degree, right? Some people say the word goal, but they don't know what it means. The, the one thing that I noticed that you mentioned that I wrote down is, I'm guessing you're the kind of guy that as you're approaching that goal, you probably move the bar a little bit higher every time. So you maybe get, you, you'd said you wanted to make a hundred thousand dollars. You got up to there and all of a sudden you said, yeah, I'm going to move that bar again. Is that, is that something that you do inherently that you don't really think about? I, once I accomplish my goal, certainly I, I then increase it, but I do allow myself and this is new um, whereas before I didn't, but now I do allow myself to celebrate a little bit, you know, yeah. um, whatever that is, a dinner out or whatever, um, for accomplishing whatever that goal is. Um, so, so but certainly if, if when we approach a goal, uh, we better have something else that inspires us lined up. Otherwise we're going to, we're not going to, um, you're not going to wake up achieve. in the morning. Yeah. You're going to, you're, you're kind of kind of, you know, you, you got to have something the way I, the way I look at it is I've got to have something to wake up to in the morning and whether it's a, w- whether it's a personal goal, a professional goal, whatever it is, I've got to have a reason to get up and grind as hard as I do every single day. And when I'm get, I mean, for me, when I'm getting close and, and something that I do that I probably shouldn't do is I move the bar constantly to grind even more because it's just one of those things that, 
you know, I've learned in real estate that, you know, there's always a bigger fish, right? You always, we all know someone who's much bigger than we are at some level. And I look at that and think, I need to get there now. I need to get to the next ledge. How, how do you do your goals? And, and you know, what, what are your current goals right now? And how did they compare to when maybe five years ago? So give, give us an example of, of someone like you. I mean, you, you've got a bunch of apartment deals. I mean, you're, you're blowing and going. You've got a very successful business. What are some goals that, that make you scary and nervous? You know, the, those big, ugly, hairy goals that you kind of go, man, that, that makes the pit of my stomach a little wheezy, but I think I may go for that. I have zero goals that make me so scary or nervous or give me a pit in the stomach. I mean, See, that's why you're zero. such a stud, man. That's why you're such a stud because yeah. you go for it. Yeah, I, I just believe anything's possible. It's a core belief of mine. I believe if you're resourceful enough, then and you foc and you choose to focus on um, on it on a consistent basis, then things will work out. Uh, it might not be exactly what you planned on, but it will be some version of that. And that goes back to, you know, after I graduated high school, I wanted to play college football, didn't get any offers, went to Blinn Junior College, tried out for the team, football team there. Brenham, make Brenham the Texas, right? Didn't, yeah, in yeah. Brenham. Did not, make, did not make the team. Then ended up going to Mary Harden Baylor in Belton, Texas, uh, Division three school. Any, I mean, Basically, anyone can play for Division three school. They don't get scholarships. I played on the JV team there, and I got it out of my system and then went to Texas Tech and had a wonderful time. Love Texas Tech. Uh, point is that I had a vision to play college football. I did. It certainly wasn't what I exactly planned on, but it, it I made it happen. I manufactured it, and – that's the same thing with our with you know my goals now. You asked specifically what are some of my goals and how I approach it. Well, I have a vision board every year that I create, and it's a gigantic poster in my room. It's about four feet long, three feet tall. I get it printed on Vista print, and it's just images of things that uh, that represent my goals for that calendar year, and uh, every. At the middle, in the middle of the year, if I have been accomplishing things like a madman, then at the, like this time or this year, I felt a little uh, uninspired towards the middle of the year. And so I have a business slash life coach. I've had one through Tony Robbins program for about four years now. And he said, well, you know what? Do, do a little, um, give yourself a little halftime speech and reset your your goals for the remaining of the year. So um, list out some things that you want to accomplish for the rest of the year. And, you know, that's not groundbreaking insight, but I tell you what, when you actually apply it, when you're stuck and you take time to intentionally write out different things and it, it, it worked. And so now I've got that printed out for my second half uh, goals for the year. And some of the goals, I mean, one, I believe in always have a having a vision for the the long term, so five ten years from now. And one goal, and it's really just a talking point, is to have a billion dollars worth of uh, apartment communities within Ashcroft. I mean, right now we got about four hundred million, and oh, and by my fortieth birthday, and so you know it will happen for sure. Uh, well, nothing's for sure, but it will most likely happen. And it'll most likely happen in about two years or so. And so, you know, it's, it's, but I really don't care about that. I, all I care about as it relates to business is performing on our current portfolio, because I know that when we perform on our current portfolio, just like, you know, when you perform uh, with on, on the, you know, asset management or management side of your portfolio, then good things are going to happen. You're going to grow your business. You're going to get referrals. Things are going to grow organically. People are going to start um, referring more and more of their friends. And um, good things are going to happen. So my main business goal is for us to just continue to perform on our current portfolio. And, you know, we'll, we'll keep acquiring properties that make sense for us. Um, in terms of, you know, other specific things, I have in, on my vision board a, a J – and the C with stars around it. 
and a magic wand next to it. And that's, that represents magical moments with Colleen. So Joe, Jay, C, Colleen, stars and a, a wand, magical moments. And so my focus is just having magical moments um, with Colleen. And that could be anything from, you know, um, surprising her with flowers to, you know, something else. Um, and so just building that stuff, that stuff up. Cause you know, I volunteer for hospice and I, um, I, I know through my work with, you know, patients there at hospice that you, we, we, we remember the moments in life. We don't remember, um, the specific things that we have, um, at least, People don't talk about the specific things they had. They tell me stories about certain trips they went on or um, certain things that influenced them or a trip to the lake or, um, you know, something about their spouse or their significant other, something like that. So, you know, I'm more focused on moments and I, I keep that uh, front, uh, front and center on the vision board. You know, it, it, it's interesting. A lot of the things you were saying, I was I was making some notes. W- one of the things that that popped out at me when you're talking about people, the hospice and stuff, is, and, and I don't remember who who said it. I, I I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. But um, they said uh, you never hear someone on their on their deathbed telling you that they wish they didn't do as much as they did in life, and they wish maybe they did a little less. And the yeah. other thing I heard was you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse, meaning you can't take it with you. And I always remember that thinking that, you know, you, you've got to kind of leave it all on the field from the football terms. <clears throat> um, but what's interesting is, is, you know, everything that you say and everything that you talk about that, that I hope the listeners gather from this is that it doesn't matter if you're in real estate or you're doing anything, you are running a business and, and real estate is a business. And, and a lot of people really have that hard time of understanding and grasping that. And, and obviously, when it's something as a bunch of apartment complexes or, or a portfolio of single-family homes or something like that, then it's a little more easier to maybe relate to. But I think the average investor that maybe has one or two properties or five properties, I think sometimes they get out of the mindset or they don't get into the mindset of an investor. They are stay in the mindset of landlord, which to me, the landlord is the person who wants to do it all. They're, they're doing everything on their own. They don't understand it. And they get frustrated because they're they're a one man band going up against a full uh, football team, and they don't understand why they cannot get ahead, why they keep getting taken advantage of, why they make bad decisions, and it's because they're not being an investor; they're being a landlord. And an investor, to me, and you know, you tell me your thoughts is that that is someone who takes information in from their team, whether it's a coach, uh, a, a business partner, an, an inspector, appraiser, management company, whatever it is. They take all that information in, they assess the data, and based on that, that's where they make their decisions towards their goal. And a landlord is just someone who's being reactionary and they're just running around. Would you kind of agree with that statement or or am I off? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so let let me ask you this, kind of, you know, again, going down to the kind of nuts and bolts, you know, you you are very successful. And and again, you you know, I, I, I think, was it last year you had a big event in Colorado? Yep, Denver, best ever conference. Best ever conference. I mean, you know, you're just you're killing it on all angles. Although I didn't get to go speak there, but that's another story. We can talk about that after. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's just you're, you're hitting it on all angles, and a lot of people may be sitting there watching the show, going, "Yeah, well, that guy's done this, and that guy's done that." But what about you know? Can you share any times where you made a decision and it was the wrong decision, and it maybe it bit you, and you had to figure out how to get out of a situation where, you know, you made a mistake and you're going, man, that was bad. I knew in my gut I shouldn't have done it, and I did it. Do, do you have any of those? Uh, yeah, um, a couple. Well, <laughs> you know, not, none of them come – so in the couple I'm thinking of, and I'll tell you about them, but just to mention that none of them did I think at the time in my gut I shouldn't be doing it. At the time I thought I should be. But now looking back, I um, like an yeah, older, wiser I, I, Joe yeah. looked back and said, yeah, yeah that, that probably exactly. was not at the time. Well, yeah, I guess. And I guess that's a good point, because at the time we all think we're making the right decisions, whether we're being reactionary or we're going off of emotions, whatever the case may be. 
at, at some point we're going, you know what, this is the best that I can do at this moment, so I'm doing it. Whether they're doing it out of fear, out of guilt, out of whatever. So that, that that's a good point. But l- let's hear it. So one, one of them uh, wh- I, I, I mentioned earlier in our conversation that I wanted to be a career consultant in addition to being an apartment investor at the very beginning. This was – uh, when I was the, when I was leaving my full time job, and I recognized that, I, and I wanted to be a career, a career consultant for advertising, marketing, and PR people. And I recognized that college students or college recent college grads don't have money to pay for a consultant to help them in their career, especially a recent grads who are marketing, advertising, and PR students. Because even after they graduate, they don't make anything really like right. you know twenty five thirty thousand dollars or something and unfortunately i had paid someone to design a website for three thousand dollars um after before i had made that decision not to do it and what that taught me is that if you have a product before you have customers then you're putting yourself in a risky situation whereas if you have customers before you have a product like, for example, when I had my apartment buildings uh, or my apartment building for the first time when I went to buy one, um, prior to buying one, I had heard from a couple people that they wanted to partner up with me. So I actually had clients or customers before I had the product. And that's a really good business to be in. So that's one lesson learned there. Uh, two is and, – and the takeaway is test things before you go all in. Um, And that's what I talked about earlier, sampling life experiences. The second thing is the fourth house that I bought. It was a fixer upper. I uh, bought it for $35,000. Yes, $35,000. I bought it with a line of credit. I was still working at an an advertising agency at the time in New York, but I bought it in Fort Worth, Texas. And um, I bought it from a wholesaler. It's 35 k they mentioned that I need to put about 5k into it. I said, great, because I have $40,000 line of credit. That works out perfectly. I bought it. I went and I hired a family or a friend of mine's dad to do the work. Um, that did not work out well at all. He, he ended up um, not doing the work in a timely manner and charging about $15,000 to do the work. And, uh, turns out it, it was his only job and he was in a tight spot financially. Uh, and so it, it, it cost me a lot more than what I thought. I, so I, I learned a couple things from that. One is when I was living in New York city, the previous three homes that I purchased were more turnkey properties. And I was doing well with those because I didn't have to oversee any renovation or, or have a, a construction crew, et cetera, uh, because it's tough to do that when you're remote. But on the fourth one, I got a little um, outside of my, um, uh, my, my sweet spot, and that cost me. I ended up selling the property. I sold my first three houses that I, I owned, but I sold that fourth one. And I, I, yeah, I think I sold it for like – you know, 50,000 or something. I don't quite remember, but I did not make any money on that property. That's for sure. I probably lost a little bit. Uh, By the way, after it was done being renovated, it rented for less than what it was renting for previous to uh, doing the renovation. (laughs) Just a little more salt to the wound, right? Yeah. The the numbers were just wacky. So um, what, how I apply that to our apartment business now is that, I have a very, um, uh, very strict criteria for what we look for with apartment communities. You know, we want uh, 150 plus units, 1980 to 2005, value add component in a major city. That's what we look for. Uh, we're not going to look for anything outside of that. We're not going to look for, uh, and the prop the property needs to be stabilized. We're not going to look for anything majorly distressed. Anything in a tertiary market, anything that's in the 1960s construction. Um, So now that we stay within our sweet spot, we've had a lot of success. But if we were to venture out, 
then that's where you know we could get it would, it would be sloppy and i don't want it to be another fourth house but magnified 150 fold you know it's funny you say that because uh you know i i you may or may not know my my past story and history of buying a lot of yes uh, I do my, my, yeah, my I bad remember. investments and our our mistakes. But you know yep. what what I tell people is at some point it makes a better decision. People equate you know when when you go to sell a property that's a bad deal. And I, I remember we had deals that we actually came to the table with money at closing to get out of the deal, and we were the happiest ones at the closing table. Because this problem was no longer our problem. And, I, and people say, man, you, but you lost, you know, $5,000, $10,000, whatever. And I said, you know, when you're on the other side and you have those sleepless nights and the frustration and the mental stress that goes yep. into buying a bad deal, there's no amount of money that, that, can, that can make it to, to, to be better. It sometimes getting free of it. And, you know, we were happy because it was no longer our problem. The guy buying the house was happy because he was getting a great deal. And it turns out he had a much better business model than we did. And he was able to make it a successful model. But I tell people, until you've walked that walk and you've been in those shoes, don't say anything because those sleepless nights, I'm sure like you had just being frustrated, whether it's a financial strain or not, that takes a toll on you. And a lot of people don't equate that toll is being anything until, you know, you probably like me where you've actually done that. And unfortunately I did it many, many more times than you till I actually learned my lesson. But it's something that it really, really sticks with me to make sure that people realize that, you know, don't make a mistake and make a bigger mistake by staying in the deal. At some point, like you said, you just got to get out of it. I mean, if, if things are not adding up and the mathematics are not working, at some point, you got to say, you know what, this is just not working. You don't take good money and throw it after bad and assume it's going to get better. And that, that was my experience with that. Yep, absolutely. So, Joe, what? let me ask you this. You're, you're moving forward, and, and we got a couple minutes left. As you're growing and you're doing this, do you have any fears? Do you, do you have a fear that kind, of you're, you're, that kind of gets you a little nervous moving forward, whether it's the economy, whether it's the environment, whatever, whatever it is? Maybe well your goals you you seem like you're you're pretty straight on your goals so that doesn't scare you. Mm, no, nothing that's top of mind. I mean, I, there, there's always the uh, y- yeah. There's always the need to focus on making sure we're performing on our properties mm-hmm. because you know I've got over a thousand investors in our deals, accredited investors in our deals, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I'd be getting a whole lot of phone calls and emails if we weren't. Yeah. So, I, yeah. You know that 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 that's a that's a you know it, it's top. It, it's not a top of mind fear, but it's certainly and because I wouldn't consider that a fear, but it's it's a healthy um, focus of mine, and you know that that's the number one priority. As long as we continue to perform on our portfolio, and we do, we buy conservatively, we cash flow. And we do our business plan, uh, then you know things are going to work out. So let me ask you this: in your apartment deals that you've had, and, and you don't have to go into depth if you don't want to, but have you had some deals that have just not worked out the way you thought, or maybe had some cash calls, or just you know the numbers didn't jive, or you have some? You know, I, I had a friend of mine who, uh, a good friend of mine, had a lot of apartments. I, I think he had about twelve hundred or so at the time, and uh, he had a lot of partners. Um, and he said, man, it's like you're dating someone for a couple of days and now you're married to them and that person becomes crazy and it taints the pool of the other investors. Have you have you had any of those kinds of scenarios with, with what you're doing or do you have it a lot more structured? Uh, it sounds like we have it a lot more structured. Uh, I, I don't believe that one investor could taint the pool of other investors if they turn wacko because it's just how we have it set up. Um, people's identities are private because a lot of my investors want to, I mean, they're, they're not looking to socialize with other people. They're looking to passively invest and go about their business and spend time with their family or do whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that being said, yeah, I mean, we have, we, we have challenges. I mean, uh, the, the main challenge is we have, we have one property. It's had uh, two hurricanes and, and um, one fire within 24 months Ouch. and it's where you live so you can imagine why it's had two hurricanes and and one fire within 24 months yeah so you know it's 
um, that's challenging. Um, but yeah, the, the, the important thing to do when you have uh, situations like a fire or a hurricane or a tornado or something like that at the property, you focus on um, what I call uh, SOS with investors s the first s stands for safety so safety of people at the property and also safety of investor capital and you um secondly focus on the o which is ongoing communication with investors you stay ahead of it you know when um hurricane harvey hit there it was in the news and if i wasn't communicating on an ongoing basis with investors about what was happening or what wasn't happening yet, then I'd be getting a lot of inbound emails and phone calls, whereas if I proactively address it, then that's that's minimized significantly because I'm leading the conversation versus reacting to one-off questions. Uh, and then the, the, th- the second S is summarize. You summarize what where you're at when dust settles and what the next steps are. Um, so, you know, having a plan, being prepared for circumstances like that is, is necessary. And when they do happen, um, you, you implement the plan. You, you know, it, it's interesting you say that because obviously we went through Harvey um, at, at the time. I think we were managing, uh, let's just say about 750 houses, um, you know, scattered throughout Houston, which for that became a very monumental task for us to Really, you know, we had to, first of all, find out if the tenants were safe, were they okay? Then we had to find out the ones that we could not get a hold of and that they, you know, they they left town. Was the property safe and was it damaged and did we have to get to it? And and just getting to the properties proved to be, you know, a huge, huge task with with the streets flooded. Uh, And then we had to figure out, okay, you know, we had to segment off. So we basically had to take every property, put them in one folder, one file and say, okay, they're either good to go. There's no problems. We've talked to the tenant or we don't know because we can't get a hold of the tenant or we've talked to the tenant and it's damaged. And then we have to talk to the owner and then we have to coordinate with insurance. And I mean, the only way that we were able to keep control of that was outbound communication. Just like you said, we really got on social media. Um, we actually got a lot of notoriety. We had a TV station do a uh, ask, have us do a public service announcement, um, just because we are so far out there, forward in front of this, communicating on the front end, giving everybody updates, letting them know, you know, don't don't call us if we will call you as soon as we know. But we almost did. I, I think I was doing almost a day by day play on Facebook, a Facebook Live videos. And, you know, we had so many owners just thankful that they were able to get some information and, you know, letting them know that we can't get to the properties because, you know, we had maps up of what roads were blocked and what properties and phone calls. And, and you know, again, just like you said, having that outbound strategy is so, so important. And obviously, if you own the property, it's different um, than managing them for other investors. But it just goes to show that communication and being ahead of the curve is so, so vital. It it really is. And, and, you know, absolutely. And, and, you know, I went through, you know, when Pete and I owned properties and we had Hurricane Ike come through, you know, we had about 20 roofs we lost on properties and flooded. And, you know, we had to get out there and get in front of it because there's people living in these houses, their livelihood is gone. And, you know, you drive up and you see, you know, just photo albums and stuff that are ruined. And, you know, that's kind of when you start realizing like, wow, this is actually people's lives. This is not just a TV show or, uh, you know, this is actually, you're dealing with people who are really, you know, they went to bed fine. They woke up, their car's gone, their clothes are gone, their house is gone, their job is gone. How how do you survive that? And that's, that's a pretty hard thing to, to deal with. I I definitely can empathize with that. And, you know, going through it myself, it, it was a, it was a big battle and it probably took us about six months to get over that hump of all the issues and challenges that came without it, you know? Um, so Joe, you know, we've just got a couple minutes left. I I wanted to, I was hoping to talk a little bit about what you do with investors and you've got your own podcast show and you've got your other events. What what other things do you have going on with investors and your podcast show? You, you can let people know where it is and and how, how they can listen to it as well. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got actually a book coming out in the, actually a month from now, uh, July, or excuse me, September 10th that week. 
and it's the best ever apartment syndication book. It's a book on how to do apartment syndication from start to finish. Um, it's the only book out there that walks you through uh, buying apartment communities with case studies, raising money, building a, a syndication brand, uh, and overcoming challenges that likely you'll come across when you're starting out, uh, meaning you know, net worth challenge, liquidity challenge, how to get a loan, how to get a lender or a, a personal guarantor to sign on, um, how to attract the investors into the deal, when to be ready, when you know, when, when to be ready uh, to attract investors, because sometimes even if you want to do something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so uh, determining if you should bring in investors first, uh, and you can go to, I think it's, uh, you just go to my website. I'm not exactly sure of the URL, um, but you can go to joefairless.com, my website, and then go to books and you'll see where that, where you can get the book or you just go on Amazon. Again, the book's not out yet. It's going to be out the week of, of September the 10th. Got it. September the 10th. Well, Joe, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show today again. You know, you're definitely one of those guys that's out there doing it, and you're, you're such a great example for the investors that are out there trying to figure this out and trying to figure out how to make this work. And, it's, again, it's always such a pleasure talking to you. Uh, maybe, hey, maybe one day you'll let me come and speak at your event and do that kind of stuff. That would be kind of cool. Uh, but uh, we, we love, love talking with you. And, again, you know, we're so like-minded in so many things. I really do appreciate it. For those of you that want to go to our website, uh, go to self manage myproperty.com and you can click on there the shows are on there as well as our facebook page landlord survival group and you can download our landlord survival handbook what we do on a daily basis managing almost a thousand properties every day for the average investor that wants to figure out what to do how to do it and basically not get sued and lose everything they own so go to our website selfmanagemyproperty.com like us on facebook and we will be back next week again i want to thank everyone for being on and joe as always it was a pleasure buddy we'll talk to you next time all right sounds great all right this has been the landlord survival show join us next time for more of what the gurus don't tell you about owning rentals and for even more, find us on Facebook. Brought to you by Empire Industries Property Management. Built for investors by investors. For more information about this show, visit our website, selfmanagemyproperty.com, home of the ultimate landlord survival handbook.